Greetings travelers. Today's weather forecast is showing it being bright and sunny with a chance of happiness. All things I am perfectly well known for. Today's edutainment tier list is about the return of Risk of Rain. Unfortunately, it doesn't precipitate very much where I live, and it happens even less nowadays thanks to climate change. Despite my lack of practical, hands-on experience with water falling from the sky, I have read wiki articles about it, sat on the floor of my shower multiple times, and watched videos of the phenomena on the internet. So while I might not be as informed as the climatologists, I certainly don't overestimate my own knowledge. Just remember that climate change is not your fault, because the idea that it is a personal responsibility was funded by BP, and look at what they did to the Gulf of Mexico. Never trust corporations, traveler. Let us then proceed with the misshapen chair LLC <laughs> tier list. Before I can start theory crafting, I'm gonna have to get everyone up to speed. Risk of Rain is a roguelike. I mean that in the most derogatory, but endearing way possible. It is a game where you go on multiple runs to try and defeat the primordial god that caused your legal cargo ship to crash land on this inhospitably humid planet, weirdly called Petrichor. You kill enemies to level up and acquire currency. Currency can then be exchanged with chests to get items that power up and augment your gameplay. In its purest essence, Risk of Rain is an arms race between the player and the game for who can out bullshit each other faster. Some items by themselves are gameplay altering enough where you can almost guarantee a win on the spot, and some are so useless it's amazing that any development time was put into programming them. That's how you know there's passion in this project. What makes Risk of Rain extra quirky from its genre brethren is that unlocking cool new potential upgrades for future runs requires getting achievements that range from beating the final boss to leveling up 9 times without taking more than one instance of damage with the lowest range character in the game. It's just a skill issue. Everything is very fair, very fun, and I never got frustrated when an enemy spawned right on top of me when I was level 9. This video is about the remake of the original Risk of Rain, not to be confused with the much more 3D squeakquel called Risk of Rain 2. 3D. This is Risk of Rain 1-2. The first rule of Risk of Rain Kiwami is that everything will kill you faster than the after images of a shonen protagonist that just finished asking their master for forgiveness. This is due to the fact that after taking damage there are no invincibility frames unless you have the official Optifine supporter cape. The goal is to reach the teleporter of every map and survive a boss encounter with a massive wave of enemies in order to progress to an even more obnoxious area where everyone can see my amazing 2D platforming skills. It is not my fault that movement speed varies on character and item build. It's also a little difficult to practice because you're not guaranteed to get this level on every attempt and I am not making excuses. The teleporter event is the most hazardous part of every level because of everything other than the bosses. This is because the bosses are fair and balanced while the ads are fair and balanced. You would rather fight 20 bosses than see even three elite enemies stacked on top of each other. So it's an excellent design choice that there's a random chance the boss encounter is a horde of elites instead. Should have had better luck. The only exception to this rule are the overloading bosses, which might as well be an immediate run killer without 1 billion armor and 1 duo decillion regen. The second rule of Risk of Rain is that the best technique for survival is jumping. Most enemy attacks are grounded, so limiting any amount of contact with the ground is just pure value, as long as you ignore the fact that it's also hard to hit things up here. Keep a mental note of every enemy that can't jump up or down ledges but can still be hit. You might feel a little guilty for exploiting their weakness, but I assure you, they will not show you the same mercy. The third rule of Risk of Rain is that the soundtrack slaps harder than my father's belt. Let's start this tier list off with the starting characters. The Commando. Thanks to having low DPS, meh AoE, bad crowd control, an ultimate move that's better suited for fighting one enemy in a game where you have to fight hordes of them and it forces you to slow down to use it, and a pitiful amount of invincibility frames on a move that barely creates any distance, Commando has to go into the S tier for allowing me to unlock the cape. 
your reaction to playing literally any other character is going to be, why do I do so much damage? This does mean playing Commando proves you are the bigger, more skilled gamer, rather than playing an easy mode character like Huntress, who's already a very powerful independent girl boss in her own right, with infinite kiting that works as long as the enemies are directly, horizontally in line with her, and not slightly above or below. However, as a prank, the developers added in an alternative secondary ability where you get to take a weed whacker on a walk and continuously eviscerate everything into a delicious meat smoothie. Of course, this cooldown doesn't tick backwards as long as one is currently active. This is probably intended to prevent you from stacking multiple of them at the same time. This is when I mentioned that backup mags let you store extra charges of your secondary skill. This is definitely intentional. Developers and designers, I know I took the words right out of your mouth. Huntress's only downside is being squishy, but not as squishy as the former limbs of every creature on this planet. For that reason, I have to put her into the 6 skills tier, and remind everybody that head stompers are fucking garbage. If you want to take this strategy further, stack some shades that give 10% crit plus 7% per stack and use a busted wicked ring to allow you to get those black hole generators up faster if you manage to fuck up. The one true ring can be an immediate run winner with just a little bit of extra critical chance and it even gives you 5% itself. Speaking of crit, getting one Harvester Scythe gives 5% crit and will heal you for 8 health on every single critical strike from that meat grinding monstrosity. But it's not great to stack Scythes because each additional one only heals for 2 more health on crit, and it's already a crit reliant item so it's an A tier item on average with the potential to be much more broken or completely worthless. Leeching Seed on the other hand is a consistent B tier item for consistently healing 2 plus 1 per stack on hit. Both of those those items work much better the faster your character attacks, just like how the death ball also scales with attack speed. To get even more attack speed, simply inject yourself with all those syringes you found on the ground. It is a bad idea to destroy your body with performance enhancing drugs in real life, but in video games, anything goes. Getting bonus attack speed on crit has the same logic for heals on crit, but it has much better scaling for stacking multiple of them together. Just a friendly reminder that attack speed also speeds up all animations on your character. This is a lot stronger than you might think on characters that have slower attack animations by default. Energy Cell caps out its maximum value when at 30% health or below, and you will take damage at some point. Personally, I like this item just because it's very anime when my character starts attacking faster the closer they get to death. Congratulations on listening to that entire spiel about attack speed and crit, because it is the optimal strategy on all characters and yes, I realize I just described a role in League of Legends. So either get lucky with item drops or just cheat with the command artifact found in the top right corner occasionally on the map that I'm good at platforming on. This is another one of those classic philosophical debates. As the great Aristotle once said, if you use the command artifact, you're a bitch. And I'll be honest with you, Traveler, just do what's fun. Or simply cheat to get all the footage that you want for your YouTube video faster. The only thing I will say is stopping to pick out items does eventually become a chore on runs that are going on for over two hours. But the command artifact is also the only practical way to unlock the alien head. And Chef. The Sashimi Master is the best boss killer in the game in my opinion. It's not immediately obvious, but Chef's ultimate ability augments their next skill, and will throw out 9 piercing cleavers that also boomerang back. That's 18 times as much damage if you land all of that for travelers who were traumatized by multiplication tables. In addition, all of those cleavers can hit multiple enemies at once with no damage falloff. This gets very stupid very fast, especially if you get an Agnium Scepter which augments the next two basic attacks instead of one. Although, that item varies on how good it is depending on the character, but you're never upset about finding one. 18 cleavers in quick succession is a war crime that you're on the winning side of, and probably won't be prosecuted for. Chef can also oil up and burn enemies to stun them while pushing them back simultaneously, which is why when putting all this together they are a C tier character. Chef is a perfect embodiment of the fourth rule of Risk of Rain, which states, it's easy to stack damage, it is not easy to stack survivability. Unless you are using command, in which case 1 infusion, 1 cape, 10 teddy bears, 10 scarfs and you're good to go. The chef has low movement speed, that gets even worse when attacking, and also has no real mobility skill to get out when shit hits the fan. Despite having ludicrous damage output, chef is very easy to die with, and that does end the run according to my research on wiki.g.
GG. Not all hope is lost though, as there are ways to survive besides healing on hit. Monster Teeth heal for 10 health plus 5 per stack for each kill, which will happen pretty often. So the earlier you get that infusion, the better. Medkits heal for 10 plus 10 per stack after every hit that you take and a small delay. You will take damage at some point in the run, but not as often as killing enemies if you want to survive. It's arguably luckier if you get to stack brooches because it's a flat 15 shield per kill per stack. How fast does this type of shielding decay? About this fast. Sprouting Egg and Mysterious Vial are just generally good because I said so, especially because every character will get naturally mega boosted regen to about 40% of their max HP if going for several seconds without taking damage. Bitter Root gets even more better with that infusion, but there is a hard cap of 9999 HP. Don't ask how I found that out. Guardian's Heart is kinda okay because it is just a flat shield of bonus health that regenerates after a few seconds of not taking damage. Let me set the record straight though. Flat healing is extremely powerful early into the run, but becomes less relevant the longer it goes. However, early game can also sometimes be the hardest part to overcome. Therefore, if an item is something to crutch on early before getting something with better scaling, it is not useless. Unlike Vultic Mitt. Healing isn't the only way to be a survival expert. Tough times give 14 armor, which has logarithmic scaling damage reduction. Great, now I have to explain logarithmic scaling. Please don't click off the video. This is what the calculation looks like for damage reduction. Long story short, you get diminishing returns the more you stack. Ignoring a character's base armor that they gain per level, at 10 teddy bears it's a little over 58% damage reduction, and at 20 teddy bears it's a little over 73% damage reduction. That might not sound like a lot at first, but I assure you, 10 of these bad boys are basically mandatory if you want to get a long run going. Stacking dodge chance also scales in a similar way. It does say a 10% chance to dodge, which is almost true for the first one, but it's a 50% chance at 10 stacks and continues to diminish from there. While it is not consistent like the teddy bears, it will be an absolute lifesaver. I know that it personally bailed me out from getting the no damage taken achievements, so I allow it to sit at my lunch table. Scarfs can also occasionally let you use a health sacrifice shrine for free. Now that's what I call fraud. And of course, while we're talking about surviving, I have to discuss the Bungus. That shit sucks. But, if there is a moment to catch your breath, and stand still, and not attack, and not take damage, it is percentage HP based regen per second. So it is not going to do anything most of the time, but it is not completely worthless. It would be a lot stronger if you could stop time. For all of my Risk of Rain 2 fans out there who are watching this video, Fungus does not work when the turrets are firing. But what does work is freezing time for 3 seconds when falling to low health. This normally has a 7 minute recharge timer, but each new turret gets a new hourglass. Normally, 3 seconds is not enough time to bail you out of some bullshit. But each stack of the hourglass adds another second to the time freeze, and multiple turrets freezing time multiple times over is pretty alright. It's an A tier only with Engineer and a D tier everywhere else. Instead of the fungus, better percent HP healing comes from the Little Shop of Horrors, where killing enemies will cause multiple healing fruit to spawn from their blood over time. That stuff is awesome, but it is also a red item, which is not always easy to get. Instead, the Memorial Union Construct will heal you for 2.5% of your maximum HP every 5 seconds after activating the teleporter. It's subtle, but good. This explanation interrupted some other stuff I wanted to mention about the Culinary Expert. Chef's utility of greasing up and setting units on fire sucks partially because it forces melee engagement. That's why being a responsible adult and killing 15 units at once to unlock the unlit Molotov cocktail makes it easier to keep distance, increases moonwalking speed, and requires no commitment to use. Perfect for a chair with such issues as myself. The Kirby Final Smash ability is rather interesting to examine. Despite massively gutting the boss killing potential I just bragged about, it does give a melee crowd control skill that provides temporary buffs which are very strong. Provided you can survive the animation lock, wait out the cook time, and make it back to pick up your order. I thought I would completely hate the skill, but it is an amazing crutch early into a run. Still not my favorite though, because survivability is not just about armor and regen. As said in Pirates of the Caribbean, 
Dead units can't do damage, which everyone trying to grab zero defensive items will quickly learn doesn't usually work. It is still important to try to get anything with additional area of effect damage, like gasoline, will-o'-wisp, a ukulele, or my personal favorite item, the knife from Omori. It's like exploding enemies on death, but guaranteed to do damage no matter how far away everyone else is. Or if you're a lucky bastard, get a Risk of Rain 1 Happiest Mask. AoE is important because adds are the most dangerous things to be left alive. That's why it's very fun trying to stack them up to get the multi-kill achievements. It would be a lot better if every fourth attack pierced. The drill that pierces the heaven is actually a bit underwhelming. Although, entertaining with lots of attack speed. The laser turbine is like the drill if it happened less but was incredibly satisfying. The plasma gun on the other hand is a less satisfying laser that tethers an enemy and damages everything in its path. It does damage on one target and it's a miracle if it manages to hit anything else. The other laser threader is like the knife if it procced on hit and could miss. Although with how often it procs, it's going to acquire value. But the most consistent AoE item is the big fucking behemoth, which makes all attacks simply explode. That means it effectively does bonus damage on one target, and against big packs it is a godsend. That takes care of most AoE damage items, but what about damage damage items? I already explained critical chance and attack speed, but other items will boost damage without interacting with either of those stats. Which is why I'm first going to mention the dice that give a 7% crit chance pity on every failed gachapon attempt, and loses all stacks in between levels. This is honestly the best iteration of this item because it doesn't punish my gambling addictions. Speaking of penny slots, the spicy penny gives 3% percent crit and creates one currency per critical hit per stack. Fake money by itself can be a little hard to evaluate in terms of worth, but 3% crit by itself is something. The less shiny knife from Omori has a 15 plus 15% 15 chance per stack to inflict a 3 second hemorrhaging debuff on hit. Unlike Risk of Rain 2, each new bleed proc does not reset that 3 second timer to stack them infinitely. Which is my conclusion after analyzing my footage, because I cannot find any information online about its behavior in Risk of Rain Revengeance. I will uninformedly put it in my tier list anyway, like a true YouTuber. If instead you want a dot that stacks its damage up to 10 times over and heals for each stack when the enemy dies, I'd say that's a very specific item to want, but it is in the game. The Sticky Bomb has a 9% chance to sticky an enemy, and each additional stack boosts its damage, but not the proc chance. Despite exploding, it is not an AoE item, but the damage output is quite good. The mortars are like the sticky bombs if they could miss. The missile launcher is like the mortar if they couldn't miss, but stacking it increases the proc chance and not the damage. Don't be deceived by my poor word choice, it's actually very strong. So is the red outline version, which shoots three missiles on proc instead of one. The old hatchet sounds a lot better than it is, but better than where your mind goes after I say that. The shattering hammer, on the other hand, eviscerates your enemy's teddy bears, causing massive emotional damage. And it is as good as it sounds. Good luck unlocking it. And finally, the hitless marks an enemy to assassinate that increases damage by a flat amount per successful assassination. So there's about three caveats to this item. It's bad to get later into a run because it's not easy to stack, it doesn't offer anything immediately on pickup, and flat damage, in short, is better for characters who attack faster. What does that mean? Commando can actually abuse it, the death wheel completely overtunes it, and the rest of the cast is either indifferent or hates it. I believe that all averages out to about a C tier for travelers who are trying to keep track at home. That takes care of how to kill things, but as Joe Biden once didn't say, you don't have to murder everybody to break their will. Fun fact, stunned enemies can't do damage. As a core mechanic, if enough percentage max health is dealt to an enemy in a single hit, it will briefly flinch them in their tracks. This is pretty noticeable on characters with heavy hits for basic attacks, but others don't have the same luxury. The lower an enemy's health pool, the easier it is to flinch them. Why is this important? Well, since elite enemies have way higher health totals, they casually become immune to flinching in most cases. Combine that with them doing a billion damage, and I think you can put together why they're so scary. 
it's because they're a different color. That's why stun grenades, stun guns, dropping snares, and every ability that has hard CC that works against the elites is so goddamn useful. But, even if it's not outright stopping them in place, soft CC that helps keep enemies at arm's length is still good. Stuff like the kinky handcuffs, permafrost, and boxing gloves. Although that one can be a little bit annoying by pushing stuff out of range. Just like how having a chance to make enemies flee from you on hit would only be good sometimes. Imagine if there was an item that slowed enemies and did damage over time as well. That would be pretty jazzy. All of this falls under the staying alive through utility category, a word that means absolutely fucking nothing without context. The easiest utility option is to simply file a restraining order to keep other units out of range, a revolutionary tactic for any character that can shoot across the map. So, the Prima Guide strat is abandoning the teleporter after pressing the button to get away from the horde. Do not worry. It will still charge without you there, and once it's complete, enemies will stop spawning. That's the coward's way to avoid dying 50 times for 40 hours of gameplay. That second life doesn't usually turn around an already losing run. I mentioned jumping before, but double jumping makes it even easier to navigate the map and stay off the scary ground for longer. Combining that with broken jetpacks can help maneuvering even more. Movement speed is just a good stat to have, particularly because many attacks can be avoided by walking straight through them apathetically. This makes you seem really cool and good at the game, which impresses your desired partners. Even out of combat move speed is solid for gathering up items after the teleporter charges. The Red Whip can also help locate the teleporter as quickly as possible by refusing to talk with solicitors. And the Harpoon makes kiting even easier with killstreaks. The character who exemplifies all of this mobility is Pilot. Depending on what utility skill you select, you can either wave dash up walls or paratroop temporarily. This would make them a broken character if their basic fire could hit the ground from the sky. It cannot. Instead, they can bail themselves out of a suboptimal situation but can't completely abuse it, unless stacking a billion backup magazines to spam their secondary skill which does hit the ground while gliding and keeps them airborne. If you manage to get a setup going with crit and the ring, it's very easy to snowball into a carpet bombing legend that would put Henry Kissinger to shame. Here at Misshapen Chair LLC, we do not condone the actions of Henry Kissinger. We respect our Cambodian advance and we'll piss on Kissinger's baby if given the opportunity. At least every third basic attack pierces to remind you how underwhelming the drill is. That's why they're an S-tier character. All this talk about surviving makes me wish it was possible to just block damage. That's what Enforcer does. Kinda. Kinda because your riot shield will block whatever damage is coming from in front of you. And in front of you varies widely depending on how the game feels in that exact moment. My recommendation is to serve the game a delicious home-cooked meal and pat their head before playing. Oh, sorry, my fetish is leaking into my content again. Just keep in mind that the cape heals for a flat amount per hit taken while blocking, which applies to the small invuln that it gives you on occasion, but also applies for all damage blocked by the Enforcer Shield. It's a pretty obvious match, which is why you unlock the cape by playing Commando. While in shield mode, he moves slower but also gains a significant attack speed boost. Jumping will cancel shield mode, and by staying in that for 5 minutes straight while in combat, you can finally unlock Methylphenidate to use 100% of your brain. In addition, Enforcer has a mid-range gun with high damage that's likely to flinch monsters, a knockback, another knockback built into going into shield mode, and a big stun. All of this makes Enforcer an obvious C-tier character. Thank god shielding and de-shielding has a long-ass animation. It would be better to be a melee character with a 2 second invuln on a 3 second cooldown after it wears off. Loader is one of the characters where mashing does make you attack faster. My microphone is very sensitive. This basic attack also knocks up enemies to prevent them from attacking. Spamming that attack and spamming that invuln makes this feel more like playing a gorilla defending its territory that they also decided to give a grappling hook to. I kinda hate the skill because it requires a quarter of a second to launch the projectile and then you also have to account for the travel time Time before you finally start grappling. One piece of tech that I didn't understand, if you grapple an enemy and hold a walking direction, you'll stop once you reach them, but if you let go, you'll fly past them. You're welcome for that piece of information that you'll forget in the heat of the moment. If you decide to go loader, get the alternative ultimate to mash even harder. I gotta put him into the S tier.
Bandit is another character that mashing does actually make him shoot faster. Bandit also has a solid stun to keep enemies at bay and the ability to go invisible and invulnerable at the same time as long as you don't attack for its duration. Amazing for getting out of a tight spot. As an alternative, he can also make a safe space where enemies lose the ability to attack. He also has a single target nuke that resets all cooldowns if it lands the killing blow, or stack a damage buff depending on loadout. All of this makes Bandit just a damn good character. However, they did remove the infinite move speed exploit that was present in the original game and I can no longer recreate Takenyan's speed. It's okay, I will forgive you though for adding ladder boosting into the game. You motherfucker. The Miner. No, not that kind. The Coal Miner is a melee character with a very weird attack animation that looks as if he's flailing his arms around helplessly. If this was the original game, that would be true, because this character's shtick was being the original character. It's him, John Risk of Rain. Both mobility skills grant invulnerability for their animation, and his ultimate keeps him airborne longer to avoid hitting the salted earth where all the damage is. But, this new and improved version of Miner can charge up heat to set himself on fire, which I'm told is a good thing. It's probably better than getting Numano Ultra Microscopic Silicofacanaconiosis. Yes, I have been wanting to include that word in a video for years and shoehorned it into this script. You're welcome. Being inflamed increases DPS, reduces cooldowns to zero in exchange for it costing heat instead, and looks extra stylish. He is surprisingly fun to play and infinitely better than the original Miner in every way. B tier. The Sniper is my favorite character in multiple games purely from a personality perspective. The gimmick is that they have to manually reload, which rewards good timing at the rhythm game of figuring out what the hell your current attack speed is. Want to play Sniper on masochism mode? Get an energy cell. They also get a little helper drone that when toggled will target the quote-unquote most dangerous enemy, whatever that means, and guarantees that all hits against them will be critical. What Sniper is most known for is being able to stand still and charge up a big blast, which does have some amount of AoE that I literally cannot find any information about on the internet. I'm begging you, wiki makers, what am I not paying you for? Pause the clip. Future me, what do you see? Uh, well, I'm not good at reading, but the purple bonus damage on hit looks like 119 for the first, 61 for the second, 30 for the third, and 15 for the fourth. So, 50% damage fall off and hits at least four targets, maybe more, I don't really have a good way to tell. Thanks. Even a partially charged shot does a silly amount of damage, and this will delete bosses if you manage to land a fully charged blast. Which is not an impossible task because you can jump and backflip while charging and bosses are way taller than any of the other enemies. In fact, I recommend jumping for safety in case some fucker decides to spawn right in front of you and tank the hit instead. As you guessed, attack speed does make Sniper take aim faster. You might also assume that proc base items are worse on Sniper because they attack slower. But, most proc base items scale damage proportional to the character's damage. So it's usually fine except for things with flat scaling, like the scythe. Just practice tapping backwards so that you backflip forwards in order to charge up a shot while sliding and Sniper just feels rock solid. It is crazy how a couple of basic quality of life changes from the original made them way better. A tier. If one-shotting things becomes a problem, try stacking crowbars. Any character that has a large damaging move in a single hit loves crowbars and everybody else doesn't really benefit at all. Couple this information with the fact that all inning on them punishes you for having enemies drop below 80% health and that averages all out to about a C tier according to this very official looking piece of paper. It comes in handy though for forced reassembly. Hand D is the robot janitor with a cool hat who always cleans house. A very simple character of punch, buff, and stun. His basic attacks even have innate pushback, meaning it's nice for keeping other melee units at bay. And his attack speed buff extends its duration if you keep hitting things. Killing enemies creates drones out of thin air that have various effects depending on loadout. But the heal drones are the most reliable because Handy will take a huge beating by virtue of being a slow big ass melee character with no invulnerability. Speed drones are funny until you die and blast drones have a lengthy animation that makes them completely worthless. If you want to try and go infinite with overclocking, I find the Sawblade ultimate slightly better for that. He might be a C tier character in practice, but he's an S tier character in here.
I'm pointing to my heart. Since he won the most likely to take damage award in high school, medkits are solid but so are fire shields to retaliate for constantly being bullied. That item can bail you out on every character since it pushes things away. While we are taking damage, dead man's foot will also be easy to proc but it doesn't help stop enemies mid assault. The mines can also go into that tier as well. With item drop luck, the big red breastplate gives 100 armor and retaliation damage after taking 6 hits. 100 armor is roughly equivalent to 7 teddy bears divided by 14 is hard, but it's not super consistent due to relying on taking damage. However, 100 armor is still enough to cheese through most bad situations if it comes down to it. All of these items are slightly better on melee characters since they are likely to take more damage just like the engineer's turrets. As stated earlier, abusing hourglasses is probably the most useful. However, there is a slight caveat to that that I didn't mention earlier. Turrets get a copy of every item that engineer currently has on placement, meaning if you break your personal hourglass, the turrets will get a copy of the broken hourglass on placement. Still, every item that retaliates or procs something while taking damage is just always going to happen because the turrets don't even try to dodge. Also, because enemies will always walk up to them, anything that has a very limited range is also going to get value, like barbed wire. Despite having a tooltip that says it only hurts one enemy, it hits everything in its tiny range and gets larger per stack. I'm not sure if that's a typo or a bug, but I am in favor of making the player even more powerful. It's also basically guaranteed to spread the tapeworm infection and the toxin. That's just raw damage amplification for walking into things. The stupid double sphere things that spin around are as bad as I think they are, but getting to see a bunch of them with turrets is amusing. Still doesn't make them good though. A Tesla coil is much better, but also still kind of underwhelming. Since the turrets are grounded, it's easy for them to get the attack speed bonus from the war banner that always spawns when interacting with the teleporter or when leveling up. Being in the banner range gives 30% attack speed and move speed and 1% max HP regen per second. Stacking them only increases the size of its range, but the fact that you're guaranteed to get them on teleport interaction makes them actually useful. This is still all about the Engineer though. After talking about turrets this entire time, Engineer's basic attack is extremely strong for no reason. Just look at what's going on here. It's basically an auto clicker because you don't have to mash and you receive dopamine for existing. Literally everything else is just bonus damage and occasionally helps with boss killing. Absolutely another big boy character. While that item side tangent applies to every melee character, even ranged characters can face tank if they really want to. Frost Relic surrounds you with projectiles that deal damage every third of a second. Yes, all of them do damage that fast. You also get one more projectile per stack and getting more kills can stack multiple layers on top of each other. This was made into a weaker, much more balanced red item in Risk of Rain 2 which was still pretty good. This iteration is a much more common, much more broken item. Deadass, these can carry a run practically by themselves as long as you manage to daisy chain some kill streaks and die by walking into melee range. The charge field generator is a similar but slightly worse item. The benefit is that kill comboing gives it a much larger range, but it only does damage to half of the enemies in its grasp. But it can become so massive to the point where that's not really much of an issue. It is still very good and a lot less risky than the icicles, especially on characters who are not strictly melee. Speaking of which, Acrid is the most ranged-like melee character. Hilariously, this is the damage over time class that poisons and plagues enemies to slowly annoy them to death. Acrid has decent crowd control, and if it gets bad, it's always possible to just camp by spreading an epidemic and salting the farmland. All of the knowledge that you have acquired of enemies who can't jump over ledges can be abused with toxic sludge. It's also a very masochistic creature because there is an achievement for killing itself as a boss monster in less than 15 seconds. I don't really have much else to say. Acrid is a very straightforward and simple character, but also a fan favorite and surprisingly good. Drifter, on the other hand, is a completely brand new Risk of Rain remastered character who has no mercy in her soul. Her basic attacks are likely to stun stunnable enemies innately, which means with a little bit of attack speed she can neutralize most threats through raw mashing. 
Yes, it's one of those characters. In addition, by mashing on enemies, scrap will be created. Scrap can then be converted into temporary items, which is a fantastic crutch for early game, but is not completely irrelevant later if you get lucky. She can also pack enemies into body bags when they're below 20% health for even more scrap, but it still stuns enemies even if you fuck up the execute. The real winner in her kit is when she throws piercing scrap that sometimes makes quote-unquote special projectiles. I don't even know what happens when these things appear other than melting every single enemy that had the misfortune of meeting Drifter. If you get a duplicator, the run is basically free. An easy double S to your character. The last melee character is of course the Mercenary. My actual favorite character for no particular reason. The Mercenary is a Japanese man who was trying to get back to his homeland before his transport crash landed. He wields a katana that is infused with hyper pulsating vibrations, so he is one albino Liberian trade away from being Raiden. You probably think he's a low range character until you try to play minor. Feels more like a mid-range character to me. Mercenary has incredible mobility because even his secondary can keep him airborne for slightly longer while also doing damage. Both versions of his dashes also have full invulnerability for their animations, and his ultimate also makes him fully intangible while attacking everything at a surprisingly large distance. The iframes on all of these abilities are extremely generous. Any amount of cooldown reduction allows him to be targetable only like 20% of the time. The only thing I can say is that despite having the option to have a parry button, that shit is extremely hard to use. The irony of myself making that statement is not lost on me. Gotta put him into the samurai tier. With that, I have covered all the characters and rated them objectively. I was going to just end the video here and ignore everything else, but since I'm already in this deep, I might as well talk about all the items I didn't mention. So strap in as I attempt to talk slightly faster than I usually do, which increases the chances I slur or stutter my speech, so I have to redo the voiceover yet again. Mocha is just half a syringe and half a goat hoof. Simply plain good because it's just two halves of two good items. The piggy bank will give you money over time. It's a bit hard to gauge exactly how valuable it is because it'll feel invisible, but anytime you barely afforded something, you'll be happy you had it. If you really want to make money though, it's already too late to invest by the time you hear anything. But I do find the coin purse to be the best low index fund for your buck. It's 25% more active income from monster hunting. Money doesn't do anything by itself though, unless you acquire the golden AK-47, which maxes out its damage bonus at a reasonable amount of savings. Solid item, but not great to stack. Because it doesn't do more damage, it just requires less wealth to reach max damage. Fireworks are strangely good when interacting with a bunch of random garbage. It's not like I'd want to stack these items, but when I do get a bunch of them, it improves my mental stability, which in turn improves my gameplay and the roller skates give 30% move speed after activating the teleporter. Not useful for finding the teleporter, but very useful for everything after that. And speedrunning teleporter events then playing cleanup is the meta strategy, because outpacing the clock is more important than powering up. The arms race is a weird item to talk about because it grants a drone that regenerates every stage and massively increases the damage output of all drones themselves. Drones are kind of like items if they could take damage and break, progressively getting more expensive to repair every time they explode. In my opinion, I don't want to rate drones. The beam drone does make me happy though whenever I get one, but I prefer to recycle them into permanent buffs when given the opportunity. Overall, I put that one into the unrated tier. I think it might be really good if you all in on drones, but since I rarely do that, I cannot provide an accurate assessment. The medallion will give good buffs when hitting bosses, a bit limited in its use cases since bosses themselves are not usually a problem, but in a very long run when bosses start spawning as normal enemies, it's possible to maintain some of that sauce for longer, and then is real good. If you want buffs more often, you can get a friend that hands them out to you on occasion, but they aren't as strong as the aforementioned ones. The caged cage gives a barrier when interacting with things and a little bit of cash. Better than you might think because of how many things count as interactables. And the 56 leaf clover adds a chance for items to drop out of elite kills. Getting three white item drops out of this more than pays for itself and it can only get better the rarer drops you get. Borderline required if you want to outpay the game in a super long run, but get it as fast as possible for best results. As for the missing red items, the hard light afterburner is useful depending on how good the character's utility skill is. You understand the idea of averages by now, just put it in this tier so that we can move on. The sniper scope is bad for sniper, 
ironic. It makes it so that every hit has a chance to instantly kill a non-boss monster, so a character who attacks infrequently doesn't have many chances to proc it. So it's probably better with that one strategy that I might have mentioned before. Gotta rate it high though for any time it manages to delete some wealthy elite who's about to ruin my day. The Aegis is by far the most build-dependent red item in the game. With a bunch of healing items already acquired, it's as if you've doubled your effective health. Without regen, it's like not having an item at all. You know how this goes. Fire boots, more like fucking sucks, the USB stick makes a gun appear which has to be located and interacted with to then do 40% of each boss's max HP right after they spawn. I don't care about bosses 99% of the time, but when one of these things obliterates an overloading one, I can't call it awful. If you're going to get something that only works when interacting with the teleporter though, make it rain. Full invincibility, massive damage bonuses, and slows all enemies for 15 seconds. The only downside of getting this item is that it conditions you to press the teleporter when you need a bailout, which is a horrible habit to have in every other circumstance. All that's left is equipment, that I think is worth mentioning, and the red items that interact with them. Unlike regular items, you can only hold one piece of equipment at a time, so having an idea of what is slightly better might actually be helpful. So that's why I'm first going to mention that Beating Embryo has a 30% chance to double equipment effect, and Rapid Mitosis reduces the cooldown of equipment by 25%. Obviously, they both vary on how good they are with how good the equipment is to begin with. Big Leech heals for 10 health on hit for 10 seconds and is not a horrible survivability crutch, but the foreign fruit heals for 50% of your maximum HP, and I might have said that percent based HP healing is very rare and very good at one point in this video. I mentioned time stop earlier, but going invincible for 8 seconds is almost the same thing, but worse. Except for one very important edge case. Overloading enemies still spark when frozen in time and can still kill you. They can't do that against invincibility. Both pieces of equipment are honestly fantastic, but I would say this is just not quite as silly. I mentioned the pills earlier, but looking into the mirror from Celeste creates a shadow clone that doubles all damage for 15 seconds. Holy shit. The Soul Jar creates a clone of all enemies instead of needing to kill them with the happiest mask. It is still absurd. The Thwib is cool because I like saying the Thwib. Is that seriously how it's pronounced? I don't know. Yahoo Answers didn't say. Dynamite is stupid with lots of attack speed. Opening up chests for free makes me feel powerful. You can prevent getting hit by your own meteorite by camping on a ladder while doing a billion damage. I don't want to talk about drones. The mace replica makes me mad because of how I had to unlock it, and resetting cooldowns can be a godsend on characters with long ones. It also has the shortest cooldown of all equipment, which is why it's the only time that bottled chaos can actually be fun to use, since it randomly adds another equipment effect every time you use it. Turns out bottled chaos sucks if you don't get to spam it. The snow globe can be decent for kiting, the lantern can help create a safe space, the minefield is underwhelming but okay for cheesing bosses, the pillar is goofy, the missiles are fine, the gold bomb can be completely broken, the fake body double can occasionally bail you out, the bag of money confuses me, the captain's brooch is good if you remember to constantly mash it and can always afford what you get, and the doll is very good for ending your run. It only does damage to one enemy. Dear lord, the item is actually just here to make the run harder. With that, nothing else exists and it can't hurt me. What about the boss traps? That only matters if you're cheating. In which case, one spark, stack the tails, everything else is honestly good to get at least one of except for the pet that can die. Incredible. We have now created an objectively correct, uncluttered, readable tier list and an objectively good YouTube video because tier lists are shown to perform better in the algorithm. Just like how this tier list that you see is based on what I thought would irk people just enough to get them to comment on the video. Yeah, sorry to roll back the curtain here a little bit, the meat cube especially is just there to piss people off. Risk of Rain was an instant classic in my mind. Whenever I play modern roguelites, it's what my brain automatically compares everything to, and that's definitely not because it was the first one I played. Even though I never seem to list roguelites as some of my favorite games, they do end up being my addictions that I keep coming back to instead of working on videos. Ellie can probably relate. 
It can very easily consume your life if you get past the first couple of obnoxious runs before unlocking all the fun stuff. My review of this remake is very much like my review of Risk of Rain 2. I'm genuinely impressed with how they managed to keep such a similar formula while adapting to a much more modern design. Adding some extra spice in places where the game could use it, and also still letting the player power trip out of their mind with the right setup. It's very rare for a designer to see some of the rough edges of their work and realize that it's actually a strength. So, maybe it's not a coincidence to get three hits in a row. My only real complaint is that mountain challenges are mandatory, if only they could be skipped. Still, I have to put Risk of Rain Returns into the S tier. Now let's get out there and holy shit, it actually rained where I live. A big thanks to all my patrons who make my impossible content possible. But even if you manage to watch any of it all the way through to the end for free, that's good for Papa YouTube. Supposedly even better if you like, comment, and subscribe.